I'm sure you have a lot of questions. Where did I disappear to? How are my games getting along? And what the hell is this? To answer the first two questions, everything is going great. I've only been very busy working on those games. I didn't post much about them because I'm at some spoiler territory in Curse of the Mantle. And I just wanted to focus on finishing it up because it's almost done. I don't post that many videos because it's a lot of work. I wish I could make more and I wish I had the time for them. I really don't have a schedule for the videos I post up here on YouTube. So I release a video whenever I have time for one. Today's video is a little different. What I have before you is the iNeo Air Pro, a PC handheld that I backed back in September of last year as a birthday gift to myself. And I need to emphasize because I know this is not the most powerful system out there. I know that better systems came out before and after it. But this video is not about this system specifically. I want to talk about something grander that this is a part of. Personally speaking, we are at the most exciting point in gaming. Not because of what games are coming out. And believe me, this month has been absolutely crazy. Insect. What I am excited about is that handhelds right now are far more significant than they have ever been. I think a lot of credit for that goes to the Nintendo Switch. Yeah, the Steam Deck has been making waves lately, but I think the Nintendo Switch and arguably the PlayStation Vita have been the catalyst of all of this. If you remember back in the day, the 3DS and the PlayStation Vita were not exactly thriving. Yes, the 3DS could be counted as a success, but Nintendo had to struggle a bit before dropping everything to keep that boat afloat. And the PlayStation Vita was just thrown under the bus by Sony. Which I am pretty sure that Sony's gonna do that again with the Project Q. I'm going on a tangent here, but the handheld landscape was rough then compared to the time the Nintendo Switch came along. I said arguably the PlayStation Vita deserves credit too because the Switch pretty much follows most of the same principles as the PlayStation Vita. It's a horizontal one screen handheld with the ability of playing console style games. And while it's a handheld, you were able to sync your saves to a console like the PlayStation TV, PlayStation 3, or even the PlayStation 4 to carry on playing on a fuller console setup. Something the Nintendo Switch can do without a second device. The Switch was the product of another struggle Nintendo had. The Wii U failed miserably during the same time it was trying to pick up the slack for the 3DS. 3DS was doing better because Nintendo kept focusing on it. Their best bet was to make a system that was both handheld and console. And this was an exciting prospect for me because prior to the Nintendo Switch, the main system that I played on was, believe it or not, the PlayStation Vita. I'm sure a few of you are scratching your heads thinking, wait a minute, I thought the Vita didn't have any games. And you couldn't be further from the truth. In its seven year lifespan, the PlayStation Vita had around 1,500 games. And that is not counting the PlayStation 1 classics, PSP games, PSP minis, homebrew and fan ports. I had a good time going through games like Mortal Kombat 9, XCOM, Darkest Dungeon, Earth Defense Force, Guacamelee, Severed, Dragon Quest Builder, Binding of Isaac, Stranger's Wrath, the Metal Gear Solid HD Collection, Freedom Wars, and Velocity 2X. Compared to my highlights on the 3DS, The Legend of Zelda Link Between Worlds, and Fire Emblem Awakening. Sure, there are more games that I enjoyed on the 3DS, but most of them have been just a blur. But the only times I actually bothered turning on the 3DS, it was likely for those two games. Also, if you looked closely to the first few months of the Nintendo Switch's launch, there was a comically huge collection of games that had a PlayStation Vita port before the Nintendo Switch version. Velocity 2X is also one of them. I highly recommend that one. The Vita was ahead of its time. If Sony stuck to it the same way Nintendo stuck to the 3DS, we could have seen something like the Switch from Sony. But of course, Sony had to play it safe and just focus on what was working for them at the time. Now to think of it, that was kind of Nintendo's approach too. They ditched the Wii U for the 3DS because handhelds was what Nintendo was best for. Huh. I mentioned in a previous video that I preferred playing on handhelds mainly for their convenience. But to me, I think I best realized it around 2011, when Razer unveiled one of their most ambitious concepts. PC gaming has always been impossible in a portable form factor. So we took a familiar traditional piece of hardware, the keyboard, and developed an all new user interface designed just for mobile PC gaming. And quite frankly, the result is just phenomenal. One of the biggest problems with bringing PC gaming to a mobile platform is replicating the mouse and keyboard user interface in a handheld format. And we've solved that by combining an ultra-sensitive multi-touch screen with a tactile adaptive keyboard. 
a keyboard that changes and adapts on the fly with the games you play. We're always pushing the boundaries, and our user interface designers have reinvented PC gaming with the Switchblade. And we worked closely with Intel to design the Switchblade on the new Intel Atom platform. To give gamers the edge anytime, anywhere. Not to be mistaken with the Razer Edge, Razer's current Android handheld. The Razer Switchblade was a tiny laptop specifically made for gaming. My understanding of reality was absolutely rocked the day Razer announced that little laptop. I was so excited about the idea that I was going to be able to carry my Steam library wherever I go, and when I'm home I could carry on playing on my desktop. But sadly, the Razer Switchblade never made it past the concept stage. Razer did make a Razer Edge Pro, also not to be confused with the current Razer Edge. The Edge Pro was a Windows tablet with a big chunky controller attachment for game control. Or at least I thought it got released, I never saw it released here in my country. But I've seen videos around of people playing on it. That thing was a cool device, but it was no Switchblade. At the time I was pretty upset the Switchblade would never come, that I tried making my own. I was given an AMD powered netbook, an 11 inch VAIO, that I tried to make run games. And quite frankly, the result is just phenomenal. I added RAM sticks, an SSD, a clean install of Windows 7 just to run games on it. And I would say it was a fair success. I managed to play a few games on it and treat it like a portable solution. I somehow managed to get that thing to run Skyrim and Diablo 3 at 30 to 40 frames per second. Sure, both games looked like absolute dog, but this wasn't something imaginable at the time. The only possible example was literally an unreleased concept. Just phenomenal. And I know that gaming laptops are famously heavy and bulky to this day, but in 2011, gaming laptops were technically the size and weight of an economic entry-level hatchback. The gaming VAIO was not a feasible gaming machine even with all the modifications, but I worked really hard to make it happen. And that really was part of the fun. I truly made that machine my own, to the point that I made it do things far and beyond what it was intended to do. I generally had fun optimizing games for that system. I could have made the channel like Low Spec Gamers did back in the day, Shout out to you, Alex. You were and still an inspiration when you were making those videos. But that was 12 years ago. Surely the tech, hardware, and even the software at the time were not where they are today. There were so many failed PC handheld projects like the PGS and the Smatch Z. Smatch Z, Smack Z, Smack Z, Smatch Z, however you pronounce that. These devices overpromised and haven't delivered all these years later. They were deemed scams, and I'm sure some of them were. But I think we were just not ready for that then. The Razer Switchblade was a tiny gaming laptop while these were trying to be handheld consoles. The earliest instance where this was actually working was when GPD made their Win series. Do you see how these kind of work? They're still in a laptop form. And this was around 2016, 2018, a whole five to seven years after the Razer Switchblade was revealed. And it was around 2021 where we started seeing AMD Ryzen chipsets on these handhelds, with the first being IONEO's debut system, the IONEO. And that was running a 4500U, a processor that's weaker than what's running on my Air Pro. And you know what got released a year after? The Steam Deck. I know I'm talking about too many things in the same time, but I really need you to have an idea how many things were changing at a really fast pace in the PC handheld market. 2022, Steam Deck. Every other company shits themselves and start popping a hundred different PC handhelds, both either weaker or more powerful than the Steam Deck's custom AMD processor. But like six months after the Steam Deck's release, we start seeing systems offering more powerful hardware than the Steam Deck, but with their own individual caveats. That said, I don't think it's too late for Razer to release a production Switchblade. GPD of all manufacturers demonstrated that a UMPC or an ultra mobile personal computer, be it gaming or not, is just as desirable today as it was back in 2011. Let's step back a bit and talk about the Steam Deck. I think it's very important to talk about it because it is a catalyst on its own. If you have been a Steam user for the past decade, you'd probably know that the Steam Deck was no accidental success despite everything I just said about PC handhelds. Since Windows 8 onward, Windows has been moving towards having its own software store. This made Valve pretty weary about relying on Microsoft and their operating system. The move from Windows kind of inspired Valve to make their own operating system, the Debian-based SteamOS. 
Part of the pipeline out of no order involved making steam machines, PCs built to run like consoles on TVs. Steam machines kinda didn't work, but out of it we got stuff like Steam Link, Steam's streaming solution, which also at the time had its own dedicated piece of hardware. Big picture, a full screen controller centric interface for Steam, something that Steam Link relied on too, which makes it easier to operate Steam without the need of a mouse and keyboard. And my personal favorite, the Steam controller. Arguably one of the most comfortable controllers ever made, but all of these didn't last long. Big picture evolved to the user interface that we see on Steam Deck, which I kind of prefer. Steam Link as hardware was made redundant since mobile phones and connected devices all handled internet connectivity well enough for Steam Link to be an app rather than a piece of hardware. And the Steam controller, for all the joy it brought me, for all the possibilities it made happen, was heartbreakingly discontinued. But out of it came one of Valve's most important contributions to PC gaming. Something I firmly believe without, we wouldn't have had the Steam Deck or any of the PC handhelds take up the way they did. Controller layouts. Hear me out. One of the biggest hurdles in getting a PC handheld or even a PC connected to a TV to work is the controls. A lot of PCs are mouse and keyboard dependent. How did Valve sort this problem out? By having it possible to have a basic framework to map and remap controls for each and every game. Also making it possible for people to share their preferred controller layouts. If you've ever gone through controller settings on games through Steam, you would see a community tab with a bunch of user-made controller layouts sorted by popularity and what is used the most. This is to make sure you are using what is believed by consensus to be the most optimal way to play these games on a controller. Narrell made a very insightful video on the history of the Steam controller and the legacy it left, and he worded it all better than I ever can. I will include the video in the video description. Back to the Steam Deck. It was very clear that the Steam Deck was an amalgamation of everything Valve learned since the Steam Machine days. It shows in the hardware and the software of the Steam Deck. Valve didn't wait for developers to make native Linux versions of their games. They developed Proton in order to get Windows-based games to work on Linux. Valve has a verification system set up to make sure that games run great on the Steam Deck. If that's not enough, there's ProtonDB, a community-run database in which people post their experience with games running on Proton and how they managed to make some of the more stubborn games to run on Linux. And with this, developers have started to optimize their games to run on Steam Deck. The Steam Deck is a fantastic system, surely it's not perfect. But what Valve managed to do is set a gold standard for PC handhelds. This is where all PC handhelds should aspire to be like. This is the bare minimum. So if the Steam Deck is so great, why did I go for something substantially weaker? The Ionia Pro is in fact a weaker system than the Steam Deck, despite being released after. But I have several justifications to why I went for this and not the Steam Deck. It has a better, albeit smaller screen, hall sensing sticks, and well, just look at it. It has a faded Game Boy colorway. How could I say no to that? But most importantly, it was the size of the device. One of my main gripes with the Nintendo Switch at launch was its size. I didn't like how less pocketable and more fragile the Switch felt thanks to its Joy-Cons. The Switch Lite is far more ideal in my opinion. It's not pocketable either, but it is surely a lot easier to store than the regular Switch. The Ionia Air Pro is not that bigger than a Switch Lite, but all you've seen of it so far is from the front. Once you see it from above, that portability illusion kind of fades a bit. This thing is the depth of two Switch Lights. Nonetheless, it's a far more portable device than the Steam Deck and to some extent the regular Nintendo Switch. At the time, there were only two notable PC handhelds in the market that are smaller than the Air Pro. The regular Ioneo Air, which is also a weaker version of the Pro, and the GPD Win 4, which got announced later than when I got the Air Pro. But power, many might think I might have rushed a bit getting an underpowered device for gaming. I mean, it's still more powerful than the Switch. But see, I don't think it's that bad. Personally, I don't play that many AAA games. I don't swear them off entirely, but they're really not my focus most of the time. A lot of the games I tend to play are either indie titles or older games. And do you know what my Steam library mostly consists of? Indie games and old games. And speaking of old games, the Air Pro is an absolute beast when it comes to emulation. I think it's capable of emulating PlayStation 3 games, but I haven't tried it. But as far as emulation goes, it just chews through Nintendo 64, Sega Saturn, Nintendo GameCube, and even the PlayStation 2. PSP is pretty fantastic on here too. Technically, I can emulate the Switch as well, 
but it's probably a lot more efficient and convenient just to play them on the Switch anyway. Despite it being underpowered, it still exceeds my expectations. But it's not all that perfect. Out of the box, the Air Pro came with Windows 11, with promises that Ioneo will be developing their own Linux distro for their devices. That Linux distro is still not hot. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. Windows 11 was an absolute trash fire on this device, and Ioneo's control center was not great either. On the video I did about a year on Linux, I mentioned that I installed Chimera OS on this thing. To recap, Chimera OS is a controller-centric, gaming-focused Linux distro that functions similarly to SteamOS, giving me a similar experience to the Steam Deck on the INU Air Pro. It has a few extra bells and whistles, but it's pretty much the best way, in my opinion, to have a running, functioning operating system on one of these devices. They do not cover all handheld devices, but they seem to support them whenever they get a unit to work on. But chances are it'll still work anyway. I built an Optiplex PC as a TV console, and I have Chimera OS running on that too. Fantastic sleeper build. I was very lucky that the INU Air and the Air Pro were very quickly supported after launch. Chimera OS's support adds function to the extra buttons on the Air Pro that didn't seem to work when I installed Holo ISO. That's the unofficial port of the Steam Deck OS for other devices. Chimera OS is well thought out most of the time. And I say most of the time because it's not all that perfect as an all-in-one solution. For Steam specifically, it's close to perfect. And I commend the Chimera OS team for everything they've done to make this gaming OS the way it is. But my real issue is with their emulation solution. Emulation on Chimera OS is not that great. The best emulation I could get ever to run off Chimera OS was SNES and Dreamcast. But even then, you can tune and set up things to work better. But if you don't like how one emulation core works, you can't change to another one. My solution was to separate the emulatable games from Chimera OS, and that would be to resort to the micro SD card reader in the Air Pro. Originally, this part of the video would have been dedicated to Batasera, but somehow it only works on the INE Air Pro if it's installed on the internal NVMe drive. I could not, for the life of me, figure out how to get Batasera to work on the SD card. So I left it until I got my hands on the Ambernic 353M and flashed JellOS on its own SD card. I had a very specific instance where I wanted a small emulation handheld to carry with me at a very specific point in time. I already had the 280V, but I wanted something with a little more power. I wouldn't say that the 353M was a massive leap, but at least I had access to Dreamcast, which it doesn't do perfectly, but a lot better than what I've come to expect. I've spent most of that duration playing Tokyo Extreme Racer, which I do have a video planned on it. More on that in the future. Back to Jell OS. When I was flashing it onto the 353M's SD card, I realized that they have builds for x86 devices, specifically for INEO devices. Jell OS stands for Just Enough Linux Operating System, and it's not too dissimilar to Batasera. It is, like Batasera, a library of emulators running under RetroArch and Emulation Station. Even my favorite Batasera skin works on it perfectly. But besides all that, it can actually run on an SD card. Gel OS is far better optimized for the Air Pro since two of the developers own it too. Matter of fact, one of them upgraded their storage capacity to two terabytes around the same time I did. Not an important tidbit, but I thought it was pretty cool. Performance is pretty neck to neck between both Gel OS and Batasera. My only gripe is that switching between Chimera OS and Gel OS needs a keyboard. There's no button combination at boot that will work on the Air Pro. The most elegant solution I found is this cheap programmable macro keypad that I can throw in my bag. I programmed all the keys I need to get in and out of the BIOS just to swap the boot order. And if I want to boot back to Chimera OS while the SD card is on top of that boot list, I just eject the SD card before booting. I know there are ways to get emulation to run well on Chimera OS, or Steam Deck for that matter, with something called Emu Deck. But honestly, I'd rather have my emulation on a separate drive. This way I can carry them over to other devices if I ever need to, but it also means that I just have more storage space in Chimera OS. So we've reached this far into the video and now you're thinking, okay, but what did you mean by you liking where handhelds are going? Okay. For a very long time, handhelds were more of a secondary games platform. This was where companies would throw their small spin-offs so they'd make a quick buck outside their main projects on their main platforms. Obviously, there were some exceptions to the rule. There have been sequels that were solely released on handhelds, like the Monster Hunter series, Valkyria Chronicles 2, and Dragon Quest IX. 
Where I feel the convergence of console and handheld really started outside of Japan was with the PlayStation Vita. Which by the way, unlike the rest of the world, the Vita was a success in Japan. As I said earlier, the PlayStation Vita was my main platform for a while, and whenever there was a game I'm interested in, I was hoping for a Vita port. And in that time, it was either the PlayStation Vita or the PC for me. Up until the Switch came along and took the Vita's place. The Nintendo Switch has been absolutely fantastic and I was pretty happy and content to have it be my main platform, except for one massive problem. In the span where the Nintendo Switch was the only mainstream handheld out there in the market, for a good span of time, right before the Steam Deck came along, the Nintendo Switch did not have any competitors. The lack of competition made Nintendo very comfortable. Comfortable enough to do things that they kept getting away with. First it was the analog drift that they saw as a non-issue until they got into court about it, and somehow won? Releasing games for a short period of time and then sending it back to their vault. Drift feeding a sorry amount of retro games whenever they felt like it instead of actually having a launch schedule like they used to have with the Nintendo Wii Virtual Console. Never forget the Virtual Console. And charging you tiered subscriptions for more or less systems to emulate? I mean, you know they're just taking the piss. And they've gone unchallenged with this. Every other previous handheld maker just kept eating dirt. And when these handhelds go away, so did their ecosystems. PC handhelds did exist before the Steam Deck, but they did not have that much of a fighting chance until Valve streamlined the service for them. And this is where Nintendo felt some competitive heat. I mentioned earlier, the Nintendo Switch already has an emulator. The fact that people can get a better Nintendo experience outside of Nintendo's hardware does scare Nintendo quite a lot. And before you yell at me in the comments, no, I do not hate the Nintendo Switch. I still think it's a fantastic device, still one of my favorites. I'm currently enjoying Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. What am I playing it on? The Nintendo Switch. I'm not emulating it. Also, that's where Picross is exclusive too. Nintendo still makes a pretty good handheld, and they have a pretty good grasp on the handheld market. But now that there are more handhelds out there, that's going to make Nintendo work a little harder to keep itself on top. Which means better handhelds from both PC manufacturers and Nintendo. And I think that's a win for all of us. Let's say you've been on the fence on getting one of these fangled handhelds. Maybe you're considering a Steam Deck. Or you weren't sure if you should get one of those more powerful PC handhelds out there. Hell. Maybe you've been curious about the Switch for a very long time and been wondering if it's too late to get one. I'm sure it's pretty daunting right now that there are so many options when it comes to handhelds. But let's say you're looking purely for a console experience where you don't need to tinker. The Nintendo Switch hands down wins this category. The Switch obviously does not have access to Steam, but now that it's 6 years old, it has a pretty mature library of games. Obviously it's unfair to compare that library to the 20 year old library Steam has. But all the games on the Switch are specifically made for the Switch. So you don't exactly have to worry if the game is compatible with your system. And even if Steam has the bigger library, a lot of developers have been pretty good about releasing their games on the Switch as well. Sometimes I find old PC games on the Switch, which is always a weird but pleasant surprise. Keep in mind that from all the handhelds, the Switch is the one with the weakest hardware, which will equate to ports usually running on very low specs and sometimes pretty low frame rates. That can sometimes be seen even on Nintendo exclusive games. Another negative would be that you require a subscription to play online and access their save cloud servers. The subscription includes some retro games, but depending on what tier of subscription you get, you will have more or less systems to emulate. The upper tiered subscription will also give you DLC to Nintendo games for no extra charge. Tiered subscriptions leave a weird taste in my mouth, but I'm sure some people will find value out of it. Cloud saves do not work on all games. Nintendo somehow thinks disabling that on online games would eliminate hacking or cheating, but there is a way to transfer that data manually from Switch to Switch. It's not as convenient as cloud saves, but since this is your only Nintendo Switch, I don't think that is something that you should be worried about. Also, you have the Switch tax to worry about, where some games that are usually discounted on other systems are sold at full price on the Switch, sometimes even more. But from all the handheld systems, it's the most popular on the list. You most likely know someone with a Switch, which sometimes makes it easier for multiplayer. At the time of releasing this video, there are three versions of the Nintendo Switch. The standard, which I would avoid. The OLED, which is the improved version of the standard. This one has a larger, better, more saturated screen, better speakers, and a better kickstand. But if you're okay to sacrifice the docking mode and the Joy-Cons for some extra portability, my favorite of all of the Switches is the Lite. 
It's small, light, compact, and fairly cheaper than the other Switch models. Just remember that you can't dock the light. It is solely a handheld system. The Steam Deck is the most accessible of all the PC handhelds, and at the moment, best price to performance of all of them. The Nintendo Switch still tops it in terms of ease of use. It being a Linux-based machine shouldn't scare you as the Linux version of Steam can run Windows games with the help of the aforementioned Proton. There's not much to install to make the games run. Proton is already a part of Steam. There might be a verified list of games that can run on the Steam Deck, but that's more of a confirmation that the game will work with little to no setup. Unverified games will likely work, but sometimes will need some setting up. But 99.9% .9 of the time, ProtonDB will have you covered if you have trouble getting any game to run. Chances are very high that things won't be that much of a problem. Games on Steam tend to be very heavily discounted from time to time, sales are very frequent on the store. So between the Switch and the Steam Deck, the Steam Deck is the cheaper in the long run. And that's not even counting the fact that there's no online subscription for Steam, unlike the Nintendo Switch. There's also an assurance that past the Steam Deck's life cycle, that library is going to remain with you. It will outlast the device. But you might struggle if you play certain multiplayer games like Destiny 2, Modern Warfare, and Valorant. A lot of these games rely on anti-cheat software, and in some instances like Destiny 2, they will ban your account if they catch you logging in off Linux. Now the more you move away from the Steam Deck and more towards other PC handhelds, you're moving closer to Tinkertown. All these systems are super specific and require a little more futzing about than a Steam Deck. A lot of these systems are running Windows, an OS I deem completely unusable for these handhelds, but I won't deny the fact that there are some perks of having Windows on your PC handheld. Besides Steam being part of your arsenal, you also have access to countless other online stores such as GOG, Epic Game Store, and others. But besides all that, you also have access to Xbox Game Pass. That's Microsoft's subscription service that gives you access to a massive library of games instead of buying them individually. I'm not subscribed to it, but I know a lot of people who see this service as pretty valuable, and I'm sure having that on a handheld would be an absolute killer deal compared to that pathetic Nintendo Switch subscription service. So what else do you get from the other non-Steam Deck PC handhelds. I know this comparison is going to piss off some people, but think of the difference between iPhone and Android. I'm not talking about price or openness or anything like that. The Steam Deck is a more consolidated, holistic system, usually more polished and is a point of reference for many developers when developing software. In this case, games. Other PC handhelds, like Android, on paper are more powerful and give you a little more variety. May not be as polished, but if you know exactly what you're looking for, it might be more worth your while. And let's face it, we all know someone who will base their entire personality on a spec sheet. All fanboys overlap. If you want to get the experience without needing to tinker, Steam Deck. If you know what you're doing and you're willing to tinker to get the most out of your system, Steam Deck is still a good choice, but other systems might suit you too. Putting the likelihood of the processors being more powerful than the Steam Deck aside, there's a lot these handhelds have to offer. If there's a certain thing you don't like about the Steam Deck, one of these handhelds might offer the same experience without that certain thing that you dislike. Steam Deck is too big, there's a handheld that's smaller. The Steam Deck screen is too small or has too low a resolution. There are handhelds with bigger screens, higher resolution, and even ones with high refresh rates. Steam Deck doesn't have a keyboard. There are ones with slide-out keyboards and even foldable keyboard covers. There are even ones with controllers that are detachable like on the Nintendo Switch. Also, literal miniature laptops with controllers. Besides GPD's WinMax line of handhelds, INEO even teased a Nintendo DS-style clamshell. And if the hardware power isn't enough, a lot of these handhelds have support for external GPUs as well. You get a lot of options and there's likely something that will suit you. So which device should you go for? It's clearly up to you. If you are unsure or don't want to mess with a lot of systems to get a game running, either Nintendo Switch or a Steam Deck would be your best bet. You can play games drop in and drop out and you will likely play most of the games you are planning to play. But if you feel like you can experiment a bit, one of the other PC handhelds would probably be a better fit for you. Knowing what you want with a handheld has many factors beyond price, performance, and size. All of them are a series of compromises. You need to weigh your pros and cons on devices like this. If we're looking purely for performance only, let's be honest, you will get more mileage out of a laptop rather than a gaming handheld. Sure, a laptop would be less portable than a handheld, but that's the compromise you're going for if you're just focusing on the performance aspect. You need to factor performance, price, size, compatibility, build quality, what kind of sticks and buttons the device uses, I.O., the list goes on. INEO Air Pro is weaker than the Steam Deck, but I got it because it's smaller. That makes it a lot more easier for me to carry, but also a lot easier to play games while lying down. 
Look, I'm constantly overworked and tend to be very tired, okay? If I can give one piece of advice at this point in time, is that I would not really focus on performance alone in order to get the most out of the device. There are handhelds with more performance power than the Steam Deck, but I would still recommend the Steam Deck for its ease of use. It didn't take long until someone managed to squeeze a processor more powerful than the one on the Steam Deck. There are a bunch of better displays, better control hardware, but none of them seem to have battery life down the same way the Steam Deck has. And what is considered the ultimate ultimate handheld in performance today will be outperformed 10 times over within a span less than a year. I plan to use the Air Pro for a very long time, but there will be a day where I will upgrade to a different device, and that new device will already have outperformed whatever I've been eyeing 10 times over. Remember, this is a very fast growing market at the moment. If you look up any videos on handhelds on YouTube, you'll find a sea of handheld reviews, with some being no older than a few hours. These videos will range from professional reviews to more personal X device after Y months experience videos, coming from people with different lifestyles, personalities, tastes, and preferences. All of them seem to have something to say that might might shed a little light on what you're looking for. There are also sites like Retrosizer that are mainly made to compare handheld sizes, but also in the same time they can give you other information, like what certain emulated games look like on each screen resolution. But whichever system you go for, do not bother with Sony's Project Q. I have to be honest here. I haven't been very fond of Sony or PlayStation in the past while. It's not that I actively avoid their games. I think they do have some really good games in their catalog. Bloodborne is one of my most favorite Soulsborns. Also, I think the Horizon series is great. And that's not counting the many classics on their previous systems. But after the PlayStation Vita, I don't trust Sony will ever make a decent handheld ever again. Before they announce what we know about the Project Q now, I told a bunch of my friends that the only way Sony could ever make a relevant handheld right now is if they make a PC handheld, given their success porting their games onto PC. But I thought it was kind of confirmed that was the case when they said that the Steam Deck isn't their focus when they were confronted with how bad The Last of Us ran on the Steam Deck. But no, we ended up with a remote play device that needs you to have your own PlayStation 5 to play anything. And that about wraps up the video. Thank you for watching. Originally I was making this video to be more critical about Nintendo, but Sony really gave me something to be angry about. I, but I really just wanted to talk about something that was going on in the video game world that genuinely made me happy and excited. I'm so glad that handhelds are no longer a secondary platform anymore. Do you have a Switch? Do you have a Steam Deck? Do you have a PC handheld? Do you have all three? Do you have neither? What are your thoughts on handhelds? Are you considering a Project Q? Leave your experiences, opinions in the comments below. Like, comment, and subscribe. Dislike it if you didn't like it. I'm not gonna tell you what to do. What I will tell you is that I recently made a gaming Instagram account to post my gaming activity. I might be using it for these kind of videos too, so if you want to follow me there, I will include the username in the video description below. Now if you excuse me, I want to go back to playing System Shock and Tears of the Kingdom right now. I'll see you all later! Roses Will Rise is a turn-based strategy RPG with visual novel elements. While the main game is free, it's supported by my generous patrons. You too can support me by going to my Patreon, and if you'd rather support me with a one-time payment, you can buy Roses Will Rise on my Itch.io. You don't need to buy the game to play it, but supporting me will give you a bunch of goodies. And thank you for watching.